Thank you very much, Ruth, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for the organizer um, for having me. As Ruth mentioned, I'm not a radiologist, I'm a neurologist, but um, I started to fall in love with diagnostic imaging very early on uh, in my career, and uh, I had the chance to meet some amazing radiologists along the way. It started with Chris Lamb at the RVC, uh, then at the AHT to have the chance to work with Ruth, uh, and Fraser McConnell, and then at Davis with Nuria Corzo, and now I've got a fantastic team um, at Vetorical, um, Teleradiology, and especially a big thank you to Ines uh, for being by my side uh, doing the neuroimaging part. Um, my, one of my favorite subjects in diagnostic imaging is cerebrovascular accident, and what I would like to do is to show you um, that instead of trying to memorize the way to recognize an infarct or an hemorrhage. I'm going to show you that with a good understanding of disease process mechanism and neuropathology, you can translate that to your diagnostic imaging. And there is a logic in the way um, that your MRI of infarct or hemorrhage appear based on all these um, different neuropathology or neurophysiology principles. There's a lot of confusion in the literature, uh, especially the veterinary one, about the terminology. People use terminology in all sorts of different ways that are, you know, may not be accurate. Cerebrovascular disease designates any abnormality of the brain that is the consequence of a pathological process at the level of the cerebral blood vessel. Cerebrovascular accident also known as stroke, is the clinical manifestation of cerebrovascular disease. So on one end, you got the pathology at the vessel level and the clinical consequence, but also how we refer on diagnostic imaging is cerebrovascular accident, also known as stroke. From a clinical point of view, a stroke is defined as a, as a typical uh, temporal profile, as a, tip, as a peracute or acute onset, of focal or multifocal brain signs, but is secondary to cerebrovascular disease. As I mentioned to you, to have a stroke, you need to have a pathology affecting the cerebral blood vessel. And there are two types of cerebral blood vessel disease. Either the vessel can get occluded or the vessel can rupture. If the vessel rupture, that will lead to an hemorrhagic stroke in terms of clinical manifestation or MRI finding, if the vessel get occluded, that will lead to an ischemic stroke. In terms of vessel occlusion, that could occur because of two phenomena. Either the occlusion takes place at the vessel itself, that's what we call a thrombus. And on this picture here, you can see a beautiful example at the level of the middle cerebral artery of a severe narrowing secondary to a process called atherosclerosis. And on that dog, this dog had severe hypothyroidism that led to this atherosclerosis affecting the middle cerebral artery. Sometimes the occlusion comes from somewhere else, from another vascular bed where there is a thrombus, and then via a process of thromboembolism, the cerebral blood vessel get secondary occluded. So as I say, cerebrovascular disease is what's happened at the vessel level, the clinical consequence will be either the ischemic stroke, if there is an occlusion, or the hemorrhagic stroke, if there is a vessel rupture. What do we call TIA, or transient ischemic attack? It's also often wrongly called a mini-stroke. Compared to a more traditional stroke, the clinical sign only lasts for less than 24 hours. So there is a, a very quick, spontaneous resolution of the neurological sign. Now, in human, you may know this acronym, ACT FAST, just to remind people and the general public when to suspect that you may have a stroke. In human, the brain is totally different in terms of function. There is a very large frontal you know, cortex, and this frontal cortex is responsible for fine motor activity. And you may have heard about this homunculus, which is the representation on the frontal cortex of your motor activity. And a big part of that is the face, your lip as well, in order to speak. Now, dogs don't need fine motor activity to speak or to play the piano. 
and therefore they have a totally different clinical manifestation. But in human, one of the most common place to have a stroke is the middle cerebral artery, where the frontal cortex will be. And one of the most common signs of a stroke in human will be if your face has dropped, if um, your arm is dropped, and if you slur. Obviously, you could be drunk, but hopefully your face won't have dropped in that case. If it happens, it's time to call 999. So with a TIA, this sign will resolve within less than 24 hours. So it's not something to ignore if you're human, because usually it's a warning sign. And if you have a TIA, you have one in 10 chance to develop a stroke within four weeks. So they will take it seriously. And particularly, if you have a TIA, they will look for embolic cause. So are we seeing TIA in dogs? Yes. However, we tend to diagnose them retrospectively. And I remember when I started looking at stroke about 20 years ago, particularly in Cavalier King Charles, where we diagnose often a, um, a rostral cerebellar artery infarct, when you talk to the owner, they will say over the last six months, before it was diagnosed on MRI with a rostral cerebellar artery infarct, the dog was having some similar sign, but he was recovering very quickly. So I believe he happened in dog. However, very often we diagnose them retrospectively. So from now on, I'm going to divide the talk into two parts. We're going to look at ischemic stroke in terms of diagnostic imaging and then hemorrhagic stroke. In human, two thirds of ischemic stroke are ischemic one third is hemorrhagic. So we're going to spend two thirds of the time on that and one third of the time on the hemorrhagic stroke. What I really would like to do, as I say, is to move away from trying to learn everything by heart, you know, on the, on, on, on the, the textbook, but to try to understand the mechanism behind that. When you reach a certain age, like me, you need to find trick to try to remember things. And instead of remembering by heart, I try to fall back on what I know about neuropathology and disease process mechanism. So what's happening with ischemic stroke? Well, with limited storage capacity, the brain relies on the permanent supply of oxygen and glucose to maintain the ionic pump membrane. If there is a fall into cerebral perfusion, you're going to have obviously less energy available and you're going to have failure at the cellular level of the sodium potassium pump. What will happen? The sodium gets inside, accumulates inside, and as a result of that, the water will be, you'll be trapped within the cell. So one of the first mechanisms is going to be cytotoxic edema. And then, only after that, if the fall into blood pressure, into a cerebral perfusion is severe or long enough, only after that, you're going to have vasogenic edema. So why this is important? Because in terms of MRI, sequences that highlight water content, T2, flare, but even more, we talk about it, diffusion weighting and ADC map will be the way to diagnose ischemic stroke. Not all cells in the brain are equal in the face of ischemia. The brain has neurons, and glue cell. Glue cell are oligodendrocyte, astrocyte, microglia, and then you got the fibrovascular element. And there is a gradation in terms of vulnerability of these cells to ischemia. We call selected vulnerability. The most sensitive cells are the neurons, and especially the cell body of the neuron. Consequence, we've already seen that Ischemic stroke will be seen with sequence highlighting water content, T2, flare, diffusion weighted. But you will find you know, changes in the brain primarily in the gray matter. So the cortical or the deep, um, the deep uh, gray matter in the brain. So the thalamus, the basal ganglia as well. And only after that, you may have as well changes in the what matter, but primarily in the gray matter. Another characteristic of pathophysiology is that the brain has limited collateral blood supply. And we will see in a sec, each vessel 
supply a very defined territory. And it's a great way to learn anatomy by learning ischemic stroke and to learn also what we call neurovascular syndrome. Neurovascular syndrome is what this part of the brain do in terms of clinical sign. Because ischemic stroke specifically target an area of the brain because of this you know, specific vascular uh, supply. So as a consequence, if you turn the tap in an area, in a blood vessel, you're going to have a very well-defined, sharply demarcating lesion. As you can see here on MRI, you got an example of a rostral cerebellar artery infarct, most likely the medial branches. And on histopathology, you got exactly that same very sharp demarcation. And if you think about it, disease that affect the brain could be vascular, inflammatory, infectious, traumatic, neoplastic, degenerative. And apart from vascular, none of the other disease process will have such a sharp demarcation. In terms of cerebral infarction, this is a dynamic process. And it starts with an alteration in cerebral blood flow. When the perfusion falls below a critical level, ischemia is going to develop. And then if it's severe enough or prolonged enough, you're going to have infarction. And I know that there is a word that I've gone through the veterinary literature, the word of ischemic infarct. Ischemic infarct is a misnomer. We got similar misnomer in the, in the neurology you know, a speciality, foraminotomy. The foramen is a hole. When you do a foraminotomy, you make a hole in the hole. <laughs> it's exactly the same with ischemic infarct. Ischemia is the first stage before infarction. So by definition, an infarct is the next stage of ischemia. So I don't think is a correct term to use because as we see here, the cerebral infarction is a progressive and dynamic process. But coming back to that, when you got a process of reduced perfusion, you're going to have at the center of the lesion an area that will die within a few minutes. That's the ischemic, that's the core where there is necrosis. That's lost, you can't get it back. But around that, you got what I call the you know, the limbo zone. When you're in a limbo, you can't make your mind or you're stuck. You don't know which way you're going to go. That's what we call the penumbra. And that's the area that could either fall into the infarct or potentially recover either if there is sufficient collateral blood supply because there will be some, but sometimes it's not enough and then it gets infarcted or with therapeutic intervention will recover. So therapeutic intervention in human stroke is what we call the therapeutic time window. The window of opportunity where you will or you may recover, where the, the drug that you're going to use will have an effect. It is about three and a half hours. So you see that it's totally impractical in veterinary medicine to think about therapeutic time windows because the animal will need to be seen by their primary vet being referred, having an MRI to diagnose it. And only a few treatments will be effective. Thrombolytic therapy using recombinant um, uh, tissue plasminogen activator, or potentially if you got carotid artery uh, blockage, they will do endarterectomy, okay, to remove the blood clot there. But there is no drug we can really give. And you know, people use Vivitonin and all this, have no effect, okay? the therapeutic time window is way too short. How do we classify the stroke, ischemic stroke in human, depending on the region of the brain involved? And we talk about cerebellar infarct, we talk about telencephalic infarct, or potentially capsular infarct. Vascular territory, if it's middle cerebral artery, rostral cerebellar artery, or potentially underlying cause, cardio, card, uh, cardiac, uh, source of infarct, carotid infarction as well. So how can we apply that to veterinary medicine? We use region of the brain involved. Again, similar in human, we talk about rostral cerebellar artery infarct, middle cerebral artery, 
but also type of vessel involved. And there are two types of vessel. The major vessel run in the subarachnoid space, the main artery, and then we have some branches that stay within the, the, the subarachnoid space. Example, rostral cerebellar artery, rostral cerebral artery would be another one. If this vessel, this large vessel are occluded, it will cause a large infarct called a territorial infarct. And then from this major artery, there are little branches that penetrate the brain parenchyma. That's what we call the perforating artery. And if you got an occlusion of this perforating artery, the consequence will be what we call a lacunar infarct. Finally, vascular territory. As I say, each part of the brain is specifically supply in terms of blood by one artery. And you got this fantastic representation here taken from the book of uh, Professor Mag Mark van der Velde that show you this territory. And it's something to print in color because otherwise it's absolutely useless <laughs> and to put next to your computer screen to remember what, after, what each territory corresponds. So you got, in terms of canine blood, two f the front, the rostral two-third of the brain is supplied by the internal carotid artery. The third caudal is the, the, um, uh, the basilar artery, okay? So from there, you got the arterial cycle of Willis and you got major artery, the rostral cerebral, middle, caudal cerebral. And they all have specific territory. So in purple, the rostral cerebral artery. In pink, the middle cerebral artery, which is one of the main, the larger, you know, area. And you got in yellow there, the caudal cerebral artery. Over area to remember, in gray, the rostral cerebral, cerebellar artery, and in orange, the caudal cerebral cerebellar artery. And then in green and blue, all the perforating artery of the thalamus and also of the brainstem. When I started looking at stroke, you know, it was a bit like when you're a kid, you got this panini, I don't know if you got that, where either if you like football or if you like rugby, you've tried to find, you know, the sticker that is missing. And the, the, the game was to find the area, the stroke on MRI that was missing. And it took me a good 10 years to fill up the entire you know, brain, to find every example of uh, infarct, at least in dog. And I will show you some example in a minute. As I mentioned to you, in human, because there is such defined territory, if a person is presented with a, the, the typical temporal profile, sudden onset, non-progressive, with the clinical sign, they'll be able to suspect which area of the brain is affected and which blood vessel is affected. And that's what we call, again, neurovascular syndrome. We try to do that, but we obviously we're fairly limited with the number. But we could draw some conclusion, especially with cerebellar uh, infarct affecting the rostral cerebellar artery or the thalamic infarct. We see that depending on which vessel is affected, the clinical picture was fairly consistent. Carrying on about the classification, we talk about region of the brain involved, vascular territory, also the presence of secondary hemorrhagic transformation. That is not very common, but here is a good example here where you can see a rostral cerebellar infarct, again, gray matter involvement, sharp demarcation, minimum mass effect, and you got here a beautiful signal void on um, T2 star, referring to the presence of hemorrhagic transformation of this cerebellar infarct. So why it is important? Two things. In human, if you have hemorrhagic transformation, usually it's related to an embolic process. So they will specifically look for embolic cause of infarction. They will check the heart, do transesophageal uh, ultrasound of the heart. They will also um, scan, you know, the carotid artery to look for source of embolism there. But the other thing is that the main treatment in human for this therapeutic time window of three and a half hours 
is RTPA, recombinant tissue plasminogen activator. And one of the contraindications of giving, you know, blot, you know, cluster, um, uh, RTPA is if you got hemorrhagic transformation on MRI. Giving RTPA has 10% chance of having a symptomatic hemorrhage. So if you give, obviously, RTPA, if you got, um, you know, these changes on MRI of hemorrhagic transformation, it's a contraindication to give it. Here is another example that we had of a beautiful infarct. Again, I draw your attention of the gray matter involvement, sharply demarcated. This is the territory of one of the branches of the middle cerebral artery and this beautiful hemorrhagic transformation that you can see on this dog. So what, are, what can we learn from pathophysiology to recognize uh, infarct? Typical, they relate to a vascular territory. Middle cerebral artery on the left, rostral cerebellar artery in the middle, and here, that is the territory of the striate artery. So striate artery supply codet nucleus, which you see there, the internal capsule, the putamen, and clostrium. So having good knowledge of this topography will help you to recognize infarct. Other characteristic, you know, to help you to recognize an infarct, very sharp demarcation. Again, a beautiful example, rostral cerebellar infarct, probably the most common in dog. And here, something that is very rare, when I was telling you my hunt for all the different type of infarct, an example of a caudal cerebral artery infarct. This is supply, especially the cingulate or the rostral two-third, uh, the caudal two-third of the cingulate gyrus. Infarct um, we affect predominantly uh, the gray matter. As we say, within the gray matter, you're going to have cytotoxic edema. And therefore, they will be more conspicuous on T2 and in particular in flare. And you can see on the same dog, it's much more conspicuous on the flare than on the T2. We see that not every cell in the brain are equal in the face of ischemia, and the changes will be primarily in the cell body of the neuron, so gray matter involvement. Again, a beautiful example here, anatomical you know, uh, demarcation of the territory of the middle cerebral artery, and here, another example of a rostral cerebellar infarct. What about T1? The very, very large majority of infarct will be isoentense to mildly hypoentense on T1 due to their you know, cytotoxic edema. But sometimes they could be slightly hyperentense on T1. And um, Philippa did this beautiful article um, that highlight this peculiarity of you know, having T1 hyperintensity with infarct. This can happen with territorial or lacunar infarct. It can be peripheral or homogeneous. Usually happen within three days, but it could be as early as one to you know, three weeks. We don't really know the pathophysiology, but if you got T1 hyperintensity in the absence, and I need to stress that, of signal void on T2 star or susceptibility weighted imaging, that will suggest a process known as partial tissue infarction. You may have heard the word as well of um, selective neuronal necrosis. It describes exactly the same thing. So what is the pathophysiology behind that? When you got an acute brain injury, some of the brain cells, especially the astrocyte, will react and they swell. In that case, we refer to gemistocytic astrocytosis, a real mindful to actually pronounce. But this astrocyte has a protein hydration layer responsible for the T1 shortening and then this hyperintensity on T1. What about parenchymal contrast enhancement? It is seen, but not commonly. In human, it's very well described and is suspected to be related to collateral blood supply, reperfusion, blood brain barrier breakdown. So, why is it not very common? Well, simply, if you got an infarct, you turn the tap. If you turn the tap for blood, you turn the tap for also the contrast agent that is you know, brought by the blood supply. So only with reperfusion, 
or blood-brain barrier rupture, you're going to have this reperfusion. And that's why the reperfusion is a delay phenomenon. Usually after a good week, when the mass effect is, is reduced, um, but the large majority will have no enhancement, especially I've never seen enhancement with a lacunar infarct. In human, when they get very early enhancement, again, is a warning sign for possible hemorrhagic transformation. Here you got a beautiful example of, again, an infarct with also the, the, the very, you know, the fairly obvious T1 apparent density, again, in the rostral cerebellar artery. What about diffusion weight in imaging? Well, we've seen that when you got an infarct, perfusion deficit, failure of the ionic pump, sodium get um, inside the cell, accumulate, and you got cytotoxic edema. Diffusion weighted imaging help you to actually detect that process. And it's very useful because it helps you to, quicker than actually T2 and flare, detect ischemic stroke. And with diffusion weighted, you're going to have hyperintensity, and you got an example here, but this hyperintensity is the combination of the T2 effect or T2 shine through and the restricted diffusion. And that's why always do the ADC map because what the ADC map does is remove the T2 effect to only show the restricted diffusion. So in an acute stro ischemic stroke, the typical presentation will be hyperintensity on diffusion weighted and hypointensity on ADC. An example here in human, comparing CT, you know, conventional uh, sequences on MRI and diffusion weighting, and you can see, you can barely see anything on the CT. You start to see some changes in the gray matter on T2, while much more conspicuous on diffusion weighting. So again, to diagnose them, to be within this therapeutic time window, diffusion weighting is very useful. In dog, example here that I pull for you, T2, you can see something, on flare as well, but again, much more obvious on the diffusion weighted. And you got this hyperintensity on diffusion and hypointensity on the ADC map. Another example here of a cerebellar infarct with the same you know, images of hyper on diffusion, hypo on ADC. But that will last only for a week to 10 days. After that, you're going to have cell lysis and with cell lysis, the water is not trapped anymore, and you're going to lose this hypointensity on ADC. So diffusion ADC combination can also help you to, to age the infarct, to know is it an acute one or is it an older one. Perfusion is not something really used much in veterinary medicine, maybe because we, do, we never fall into this therapeutic time window. So it's interesting to get picture but what are we going to do about it? What the perfusion show is the area where there is, you know, reduced perfusion and that could potentially become infarcted. But beyond that, you know, the usefulness in, in veterinary medicine is not yet, you know, uh, um, is we, we don't have much clinical use to that. I'm not going to spend too much time on, you know, how to, um, what to look for, but, in about more than 50% of ischemic stroke, in, in dog at least, we do not find an underlying cause. If we find an underlying cause, or at least an associated condition, they usually fall into one of these categories. And high on the list, I will say hyperadenocorticism, hypertension will be uh, you know, at the top of the list. So diagnosing an MRI is one thing, but then look for an underlying cause be aware and warn the owner that in more than 50% will not find an underlying cause. I say we spend two thirds of the time on ischemic stroke. I've got 15 minutes left before Ruth start to make some sign to talk about hemorrhagic stroke. Hemorrhagic stroke can be intraparenchymal or potentially subarachnoid. Subdural or um, uh, epidural hemorrhage usually are traumatic. In dog, most of the hemorrhagic stroke we see are intraparenchymal. So in contrast to the high incidence in human, 
where intracerebral hemorrhage result from spontaneous rupture of a blood vessel, most commonly uh, an aneurysm. In dog and in cat as well, they are usually secondary. Bl a vascular malformation. It could be also a neoplasia, but could be at the level of the brain, a brain tumor or a metastasis, most commonly a mangosarcoma. Be the consequence of vasculitis. Commonly, and at least in the UK, one of the most common causes was coagulopathy secondary to angiosangelus vasorum infestation. And as we see in some time, and it's very rare, you could have hemorrhagic transformation of an infarct. If you want to read more, um, Mark, Larry and I, we published this paper quite a while ago where we stratify the intracranial hemorrhage depending on the number and the size, whether or not they were more or less than five millimeters. And depending on that, we look what kind of associated condition we could find. Again, at the top of the list, we had uh, Angiosangelus vasorum. So, you know, if you're in the UK, that would be, or in France, that would be really one to look for. But let's look again, coming back to the topic, uh, from the cell to the pixel. How knowing about what's happening in the cell can help you to understand the MRI uh, imaging of uh, brain hemorrhage. Beautiful um, uh, image there uh, from the article by James um, Whitlock and with Ines and I and James and you know, co over co-author we published this paper on MRI uh, appearance of intracranial hemorrhage and there was this beautiful illustration showing you that the MRI signal intensity associated with intracranial hemorrhage is influenced by many factors. Some of them are intrinsic, some of them are extrinsic. Among these factors is the age of the hematoma. Because as the hematoma evolves in time, the oxyhemoglobin in the blood is going to be degraded into byproduct, deoxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, and then uh, hemosiderin. Initially, this byproduct will be intracellular, deoxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, and then you're going to have cell lysis and then become extracellular. And we'll see how this influences the magnetic susceptibility. So how can we collect, connect what's happening at the cellular level to what we see on MRI? The two most important factors are the state of oxidation of the hemoglobin and also the cell membrane, whether or not it's intact or not. So initially, the blood is oxygenated. And then you're going to have deoxygenation. It happens first in the periphery and then toward the entire hematoma, and you're going to have deoxyhemoglobin formation. As the hematoma carry on maturing, it become more and more um, deoxygenated, and the ion within the aim become oxidized, and that results in the formation of methemoglobin, which is initially intracellular and then extracellular. And then as more methemoglobin is formed, the uh, ferritin and hemosiderin will accumulate within macrophages. All these byproducts are different magnetic susceptibility, but the magnetic susceptibility depends on the number of unpaired electrons and whether or not they are still intracellular. So in theory, if you look at deoxyhemoglobin, it, is, it has zero unpaired electrons, it's diamagnetic. The other byproduct, deoxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin, have four and five unpaired electrons, and they are paramagnetic on their own. But then you need to put them in the context. They are within the cell, especially deoxyhemoglobin. If they are within the cell, the cell membrane is going to compartmentalize the paramagnetic effect. So when then we put all that together, we have this different MRI signal intensity. As we say, deoxyhemoglobin, sorry, oxyhemoglobin is diamagnetic. So it appears iso-intense on T1 and T2. Sometimes it could be hyper-intense on T2 as well. Then deoxyhemoglobin is formed. In theory, it's paramagnetic. However, it's still within the cell. And the cell membrane 
compartmentalize the paramagnetic. It stop it, it stop the water molecule having any contact, you know, with the deoxyhemoglobin. As a result, it become hypo-intense on T2 and iso-intense on T1. Then methemoglobin is formed and initially is intracellular. Methemoglobin, five pair electron, it will be hyper-intense on T1 and hypo-intense on T2. But when there is erythrolysis, the cell membrane is ruptured, there is not this compartmentalization of the paramagnetic effect and it becomes hyperintense on T1 and T2. And then hemosiderin will be hypointense. So you see that you need to consider the different byproduct, number of M pair electron, and the integrity of the cell membrane. I'm going to come back to something very basic, the humble red onion. And you may wonder why is he talking about that? I love cooking, I think without red onion, is the basis for any cooking, but it's also a good way to illustrate how hematoma evolves with time. And when the red onion grow, it grows from the inside to the outside. So the youngest part is on the inside, pushing the older part on the outside. A bit like in the, in the European colleges, to be honest. <laughs> I'm part of the older, you know, uh, scale, uh, and hopefully that keep everything contained. And uh, also, you know, the older one always have some good trick to teach to the younger one, hopefully. So coming back to the onion, the hematoma evolve exactly like that. The older part will be on the outside, the younger part will be on the inside. Looking at an example now, you got a beautiful example of a space occupying lesion on the, in the temporal parietal lobe on the left side. And if you look at the characteristic of this lesion, straight away you can see that there is a very obvious hypointense peripheral halo, or halo, depending if you're French or not, pronouncing the H. I think my French counterpart will know what I mean. Um, in susceptibility weighted imaging, you can see it as well on T2. If you look just underneath that, you see some high, mild hyperintensity on T1. And again, in the absence of signal void on susceptibility weighted at that level, that will suggest the presence of methemoglobin. Of, uh, yeah, methemoglobin. The other characteristic here is the fact that there is contrast enhancement, but it's only peripheral. <coughs> and the center is quite heterogeneous. So that will be a typical example of a subacute hematoma, two to seven days. And you got the older part on the outside with hemosiderin accumulating there and the signal void, um, this peripheral halo. The contrast enhancement is only on the periphery while the center is quite heterogeneous. Whatever you do, one thing I've been taught when I was in clinic until I couldn't bear facing another French bulldog and I decided to stay at home and do teleradiology. <laughs> and I still see a lot of French bulldogs, but I don't have to bear the owner, which trust me is a good thing. Um, nothing replace a follow-up MRI because sometimes you get it wrong and you take a good dose of, you know, humble pie. And here you can see that same dog, MRI again eight weeks later. So I will strongly recommend for anything you do, or, you know, it's often advised follow-up MRI. You can learn so much from them, and post-mortem, but harder to convince the owner. You can give them the choice. Do you want a post-mortem? Do you want a follow-up MRI? <laughs> Don't give them any other choice. And you will do much more follow-up MRI. <laughs> All that was very well summarized in the paper by James, but help you to give you some clue about how to recognize hematoma or hemorrhagic um, neoplasm. And hematoma, a good example here in the level of the internal, the um, codine nucleus, beautiful again, peripheral hypointense halo on uh, susceptibility weighted imaging and T2. This hypointensity just underneath, suggesting the presence of methemoglobin, but also the contrast enhancement only in the periphery. But look at the center, 
the center is very likely oxyhemoglobin because it's still iso to hyperentans, so there's no signal void there. So don't always think that hemorrhage equals signal void. If it's the early process oxyhemoglobin, you won't have any signal void, you know, there. So how you differentiate with hemorrhage? Well, if hemorrhage, you don't have this union, you know, distribution where things are really well organized and for, follow a temporal evolution with the youngest part in the middle, the oldest part in the periphery. An example here, you got a very large signal void. You got also absence of hypoentance peripheral halo. And the enhancement is within the center. All that should be an alarm bell, and it's very heterogeneous. An alarm bell to say doesn't look like an hematoma. Most likely, it's bleeding of something else, and in that case, suspected a neoplasia. Again, I refer you to this really good paper from James um, to give you, you know, some indication, another thing to print, to put next to your computer when you do reporting. I just wanted to finish with something what we see a lot this cerebral microbleed. So these are the signal bloom that you see on T2 star on susceptibility weighted imaging. They're usually multiple at the level of gray white matter, sometimes at the level of the coded nucleus as well. And typically they're only seen on susceptibility weighted imaging. You may see on T2 some high point intensity, but on the other sequences they will not be visible, especially you will not see contrast enhancement, you will not see any uh, perigenal edema. In human, they are frequently seen, and what they are, they are chronic hemorrhage, hemosiderin accumulation. But they are in human marker of small vessel disease. And two main conditions or type of condition will cause that, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, and chronic hypertensive encephalopathy. And in human, they are very different in the distribution of this cerebral microbid. Cerebral amyloid angiopathy typically spare the basal nuclei and affect mostly the gray white matter uh, junction, while the other one affect basal nuclei, but can affect as well the cerebellum, brainstem, um, and also um, the corona radiata. So we see as well cerebral amyloid angiopathy at post-mortem in dogs. And you may be aware of that publication, but look at, you know, when do we see this cerebral microbead? And it can be seen any age, mostly all the dog. Any breed, mostly toy and small breed of dog with a predisposition in Shih Tzu. And in a lot of these dogs, they had no sign or when they have sign, a lot of them had vestibular sign and proteinuria. In terms of underlying cause, when we did that study with Mark, looking at different size of, of hemorrhage, we find that when there was an associated medical condition, hypertension was high on the list in this dog. But also systemic disease, crushing, hypothyroidism, diabetes. So if you see that, most of the time is uh, asymptomatic but look for potential associated medical condition. It's important to differentiate them from over cause of small bleed and especially hemangiosarcoma. How do we differentiate between the two? Well, on susceptibility weighted imaging, they will look pretty much the same. However, they will be obvious on the other sequence. You will have a lot of perioregional edema on T2 and flare, and because they are metastasis, you will have contrast enhancement, which you don't see on um, the cerebral microbead. So if you find an hemorrhagic stroke, what should you look for? Well, more often you find an underlying cause than you don't, about 70, 80% of the time. Look for coagulopathy, especially angiochangillus vasorum, if you're in an area where it's present. Look for, if, it could potentially, doesn't look like a, an hematoma, but more, you know, bleeding secondary to something, look for primary or metastatic brain tumor, potentially do a follow-up MRI and check for hypertension and if present underlying cause. Again, just to summarize, remember cerebrovascular disease, the vessel disease, 
can be occluded or ruptured, the consequence clinically and in terms of MRI, term MRI so-called ischemic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke. About 15 seconds uh, to say thank you very much to the organizer. Thank you for all of you. Thank you for you know, the amazing team I'm working with. They have adopted me uh, despite not being a, a radiologist and they're taking great care uh, of me. Hopefully they will all recognize them on this picture. And if you, you know, like a bit of neuroimaging, join us and Simon, do me and Simon on this Facebook page, Veterinary Neurology. Um, we only do that because we like to share. And we post regularly some cool tips, some cool cases, and you know we do this uh, journal club every two months, especially if you are young um, or, or upcoming radiologist or resident and you have a paper that has been published, let us know and we give you the platform for you to present to everyone. So thank you very much.